So, for the audience that doesn't know you, um, tell us about you. How, uh, what's your name? I know your name, but they don't. Yeah. Uh, how the heck did you get into commercial real estate? And uh, tell us your story. So, uh, my name is Hannah Hammond. I'm third generation native to Arizona. Third generation of not having a lot of money in my, my family and my household. And I was figuring out, like, by six years old that the way I had my life and the, my environment was not what I wanted and it wasn't like right it wasn't fun it wasn't happy um, and so I really started I actually yelled at my dad because he wouldn't buy me a McFlurry uh, when I was six years old saying I was gonna be a millionaire so I could buy myself McFlurries so people call me the McFlurry millionaire uh, as a matter of fact but that's that was, hilarious Did, yeah. does your dad call you that no I don't talk to my dad okay. really but um, yeah, so that's, that's pretty funny. And then, you know, I was just like finding balloons in my house and filling them with flour as stress balls and door knocking my neighborhood and babysitting when I was should have had a babysitter myself and just starting to raise, uh, figure out how to make money from a young age. Like that was my whole focus. And then I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And that was really the only book I needed uh, to decide I was going to be in real estate. It's like, okay, millionaires are built through entrepreneurship, real estate, and stocks. So I'm going to do entrepreneurship, real estate, and stocks. And so I opened a custodial account under my dad's name. I don't even think he knew about it um, when I was young. And then started, I knew I was going to get my license here in Arizona because I was like, I'm just going to get a full ride scholarship to college because I don't have a college fund, but I still want to go to college, sure. have it on my resume, have it to fall back on, check corporate America off the list. And um, so I was really good in school. I excelled. I graduated, you know, straight. I've never had a B in my life, even through engineering school and college. Um, just pushed myself really hard and got my real estate license on my 18th birthday. I signed up for real estate school uh, and was licensed in a few weeks, went through the crash course. And then I was, I never wanted to be a real estate agent. I just wanted to be an investor. I wanted to have access to the tools and resources and the knowledge and uh, just really fully immerse myself into real estate so I can be educated about it. And I was, you know, waiting to start ASU. And I was like, I might as well, I joined Keller Williams. I was like, I might as well just learn how to be a real estate agent because I'm bored this summer, I have nothing to do. Held an open house in my neighborhood. It's a couple hundred thousand dollar house in Tempe, middle of summer. Um, one guy showed up at the end of the open house. He was the neighbor. Okay. And he, pretty, pretty typical. Yep. Yeah, um, he was talking about chemtrails in the sky okay. and his baby mama drama and you know I just mean listen and nice and all that and um, that next week he listed a 1.1 million dollar commercial property with me wow. um, that Moon, Moon Valley Nursery went on to purchase so my very first deal was commercial Wow. and my broker was just like you can't do it you don't know what you're doing we don't do commercial blah 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 um, but I still did it all anyway thank you I did you know, did you find out if that Carpaccio was around? Um, I know it's not this many, but we should have it. Okay, you, are you, would you like to try that? It's so yeah, good. I'll try um, anything, yeah. Could we get uh, an order of that? I would like an order of the French, actually three orders of French onion soup and then the, the Carpaccio. I'm sorry, I'm just Perfect. gonna. Sounds I'm good. Gonna, you don't have to feel pressure to eat it. Take a bite, you don't like it. I literally eat everything. It. Okay. <laughs> and I like, I like Bro, when people so order it's so good. <laughs> All right, I, no, 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 that's just, okay. just wet in your whistle, baby. Just wet in your whistle. Um, so, all right. Yeah, so that was my first deal. And then that, um, that owner of that property had bought it for like a few hundred thousand a handful of years ago and sold it for 1.1 million. The broker I talked to said it wasn't worth a penny over six. He's like, I'm selling for one one. I had it under contract in less than two weeks. Um, okay, so. If, if you're getting a, a, an opinion of price that it's not it's not worth over six hundred thousand yet, you list at one point one. I imagine that the seller is what dictated that price, yeah. right? Um, was it worth one point one? It was. Someone paid it. Okay, great answer. <laughs> How did you accomplish that? Found the right buyer. So you found the use case and you sold the use case instead of just looking at it from like the general perspective of right. this is what it would be, this is what it could be worth for this or that. Yep. You found somebody that had a specific need for that specific kind of property in that specific uh, location mm -hmm. and created the opportunity that way. Yeah, and the value came from the rezoning. So mm. the, it was zoned multifamily. Um, and so a multifamily valuation would have made sense around the 600,000 per, based on how many units you could build on it and the cost to develop and all of that. Um, so, you know, that's what people thought it was worth. But someone coming in saying, well, I'm gonna 
build a nursery here. I'm going to zone it on a special zoning for agriculture and a nursery, and my income is going to be this. Well, now the lot value changes completely. So it took the right buyer. Um, it was lucky for sure, I think. Um, but the harder I work, the luckier I get. So I don't know. It's very real. <laughs> but, very real. Um, it worked, and then you know, and then that owner had a big tax liability. So I was like, how do I save him on taxes? And that's when I learned about 1031 exchanges and um, had him 1031 exchange into um, a, a million dollar mansion in Shroon. This was 10 years ago. So prices, you know, yeah, are a worth, lot higher it, now. It, yeah, it's worth like 10 million today, right. I imagine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so I learned the, the commercial side, the 1031 exchange side, and then the luxury side. And so I knew right away, I was like, I love commercial. I love luxury. Uh, wealthy people buy commercial real estate or own businesses that have commercial real estate. And then they also buy luxury houses. And so in the back of my head, I was like, it'd be cool to have a brokerage that specialized in commercial and luxury, uh, you know, someday, whatever. And then, um, so that was 36,000 times two, um, 70,000 ish, 72,000 that I made uh, from those first two deals, basically right before college. I do apologize. I did believe that they had it. We were missing one sauce. I cannot do the tax professional, but I do have a lot of tips Okay, we'll, we'll keep looking then. Okay, thanks. Let's take a look here and see what we, what we should do. You want to try these duck spring rolls? Yep. Okay. And are you a fan of avocado toast? Yep. Okay. Except it's probably going to get my teeth. That's okay. <laughs> the camera is not seeing it. I'll, I'll be the only one that can see it. So don't worry about it. Um, okay, so we're getting um, duck spring rolls, some avocado toast. And then I'll stop being your dad, and you can pick what you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Me neither. Me neither. I think I'm going to, I think I'm, oh, man, I think I'm going to have a croissant turkey club, bro. You're going to get what? Brioche egg sandwich. OK, that's fancy. Yeah, I'm a fancy guy. All right, I'm, I'm with it. I thought you would have gotten like the boiga. The, no? Pan crepes. What did you guys talk about when I was gone? Uh, you. <laughs> no. So we talked about her first two deals. Yeah. And um, she had done them right before she went to college and made like 72,000 bucks like a week before she goes to college. And, I, and that's kind of where we left off, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, I used that money, put some in a stock account and... Uh, Are you still invested in the stock market now? No. Okay. I hate the stock market. Yeah, I have Bitcoin. Okay. It's on Me a too. run right now. I know. Yeah. I keep looking at my Coinbase like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is nice. Fuck you guys. I sold mine three weeks ago. You did? Oh, yeah, that sucks. Hey. Well, three weeks ago was still good, though. Yeah. It's about even. Yeah. Okay. My thing with this market, though, whether it's Bitcoin or stocks or whatever, like, I don't trust it enough to actually put a lot of money in there. So even if the returns are good, it's not going to change my life. Like, sure. real estate, I trust. Like, I'll lend a million dollars today. I'll buy a $50 million asset today. Like, that I'm, I'm so confident in. Even if your returns are smaller, which sure. mine the, haven't the been. The security is but, there for Yeah, you. right. So, um, yeah, so I did some stocks. Uh, and then I bought my... I, my parents got divorced right when I turned 18. Said, you know, flee the nest. And so I bought my house to live in for college. It's a one-bedroom condo in Arcadia area. And I... It was $76,000. I put 20% down and I put eight to $10,000 into renovating it, 900 square feet or something. Yeah. And um, furnished it, lived in it for a short period of time before I bought my next property, which was then a two bedroom uh, patio home. And then I rented that one out fully furnished. So I was kind of doing fully furnished rentals before fully furnished rentals were a thing. And I was making a ton of money because I was just, how do I maximize my return on investment? And now how old are you at this time? Because it's like you're 18. It, it's incredible, <laughs> Hannah. Like, I, I mean, I got, I got involved in real estate young, not as young as, as you, 
Um, but and it was you didn't have like a, a parent or somebody that guided you there. You just you you read the book. Read the book. You yeah. find out this. These are the these are the areas where people become wealthy. You set your target and you just went after it. Yeah. Which is which is I mean really incredible, right? So. Okay, keep keep going. I'm just I'm, I'm I'm digesting this all right now, and it and it's incredible. It's like it's it, it's it's rare, right? It's it's especially for a young female. Quite honestly, it's not it's not, it's not as prevalent as you would see in um, you know with 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 men. But yeah. anyhow, just yeah, keep going. I think um, a big driver was you know I didn't have like a father figure or like all the men. My brothers were really hard on me, um, you know, physically and, and mentally, and uh, they were much older than me. Uh, you know, my father figure really wasn't existent, um, and so I like from a young age I was like you know survival mode like fight or flight I was like okay how do I take care of myself like I was like I'm never getting married never trusting a man men suck blah 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 so like I was just really a a male um, mentality from a young age because I was never the girl that was like oh I'm gonna get married and have kids and be a wife and all that stuff because it was just a different reality for me and so that was really my driver was like how do I secure myself to where I'm safe I have shelter I have food and I have freedom Uh, because I wasn't free Oh my gosh. Damn. Uh, and so freedom was my real driver yep. to become financially free. Uh, you know, freedom to take care of myself, have the things I want, take care of the people that I love, and not have to be in a position of a relationship, a job, a house, a home, anything that I didn't want and that didn't make me happy. Um, and. So I worked really hard though. Like I worked my ass off. I didn't. I was really depressed and anxious as a kid. I didn't really have a big social life. Um, I was super nerd, just read, you know, studied and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, I think like the next year I bought my second property, rented that one out. I cash. I still have that property, the condo. I cash flow two grand a month on it, um, and it was a twenty thousand dollar investment. Wow. And I've been doing that for ten years, and it's worth. 250. Yeah. Um, and then I bought my second one, renovated that one, and was going through school and uh, was selling some real estate on the side, but really wasn't focused on that. I mean, I was a dual engineering major in three years, which pretty much took all my time. Engineering? Yeah. Very Indian of you. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> So I just went to school. I was like, what's the hardest degree that will pay the most in the least amount of time? Yeah. Where I don't have to like go get she, a job. No, no nonsense. Yeah. Just like, so um, you, you thought about medicine? Yeah. Um, but I was like, I don't want to go to eight years of school, mm-hmm. you know? And I, if I look at blood, I pass out. So mm-hmm. I didn't really think about medicine. A lot of people, like my teachers all told me to be an attorney. Mm-hmm. So I thought about that for a while. Um, or a psychiatrist. I could see that. An attorney, for sure. Yeah, my nickname's The Hammer <laughs> in negotiations. So, uh, oh my gosh, this is The Hammer. Hannah the Hammer Hammer? Yeah. That is, that's like a fucking wrestling name. <laughs> yeah. So, that, uh, I, at the end of the day, I just wanted to get out of school as fast as possible. Okay. I was out of there in three and a half years. Then, Wait, you did a four-year de- four degree in three and a half? I did like a seven-year degree in three and a half. But, um, yeah. I did. I graduated with um, basically a 4.0 GPA, magna cum laude or whatever that award is. I don't know. And um, got offered a job for Empire Cat, the cat dealer for mm-hmm. Arizona. Um, the big tractors and mm-hmm. mining and stuff like that. So I was an engineer for them. Um, I started working for even graduated for them and that was awesome like private jets flying around company credit card company vehicle like really nice you know car I was like oh this is awesome and the owner of the company you know he's a billionaire basically and he was really awesome and I got mm-hmm. to talk to him and learn you know he said if you take care of the farm the farm will take care of you he said that's what his grandfather taught him when he gave him the company and so, you know, I was just focused, like, how do I help other people? How do I make other people money? How do I serve others? Uh, because if you do good in the world and you do good for others, 
you'll be taken care of, right? It's, if you water your crops, they'll feed you. It's so interesting that you come up with this mentality, which you're very true, very right about, because uh, I, I do believe that's how it works as well. Sorry. They're really Amazing. good. Amazing. Thank you. Um, we're gonna have the duck spring rolls. How many? How many come in an order of that? Three. Perfect. Um, yeah, is that good? Should we get, okay. No. One of those, and then an order of avocado toast. Yeah, and then he wants the the brioche egg sandwich. Have you thought about what you'd like as a? Uh, what What is? Let's see. Can I go just? Can I do the? Um, the pink dolphin bowl without egg, please. Yeah, sorry, say that again. Brioche egg sandwich. The avocado toast with an egg, the, uh, no, the avocado toast, just regular, no egg on it. Oh, regular, no egg? Yeah. And then duck spring rolls. Duck spring rolls. Egg sandwich, and avocado yes, and then um, I'll have the, the turkey club. Those starters are just for the table. The spring rolls yeah. and then Thank you so much. I think I think that might. We'll leave one just in case. She said she's a foodie, so we'll see. What do you think of that French onion soup? Amazing. Though? Isn't that crazy? So good. So yeah, and then from there, I worked at Empire. Um, you know, there was the option to work my way up in that company pretty quickly. Uh, I ended up dating a guy that worked there and it's a whole another story for another day, mm -hmm. but I ended up breaking up with him and uh, quitting at, at that point and um, moved to Hawaii, took a year and a half. Holy shit, okay. Kind of sabbatical. That, now that, I would have not put money on. <laughs> yeah. Because somebody as driven as you, as, uh, you know, destination focused, doesn't fuck off to Hawaii for a year and a half, right? Well, so no. how does that happen? Is it you heartbroken or like was that did, what what turned what turned what made the tangent? Um, so I by that time I had three rental properties that were cash flowing 65, 70 grand a year ish. Okay. Um, and my friend, so the relationship involved things I couldn't talk about, drugs, um, a lot of bad stuff that he was doing that would have put you know, him and, and or I in prison. Mm -hmm. So that's why I got out of it because I was like, uh, my it. life is yeah, in danger, was, right? And risky. I didn't know yeah. that when I got sure. into it. Sure. So um, I was just like, I there's no one I could talk to. I couldn't talk to my family. I couldn't talk to my friends. I couldn't talk to anybody. Like it was just me and that, that person and I just felt very unsafe. And so I just wanted to run like as far as I could go. Got it. Um, but I had the one person I told what was going on happened to be a therapist not my therapist I knew her as a person and she was a therapist and she's like listen all you've done is grind like you need to take some time and like go live for a minute and breathe that is some and, therapist shit though yeah. like right okay now and it I makes listened sense to her. Yeah. so she told me that it was the only person I had to talk to and yeah. I was like okay and so I quit my job I bought a one way ticket and I moved to Hawaii of course like two months later I was like this is fucking boring you can't. <laughs> uh, yeah I was like um I want to go home now. But and then did you? Did you go home? No, you stayed a year and a half. I got my real estate license. In Hawaii? I started okay. selling timeshare, making 50 grand a month, doing timeshare or whatever. Hated it, though. Um, I mean, 50 grand a month selling timeshares, you must have been the top salesperson in there. That was good. Yeah. But I was unhappy. Okay. Because um, you didn't like the product? It's just rejection all day long, mm -hmm. and it's working for someone else. I, I'm an entrepreneur, and I like people coming to me for my services. I'm not a salesperson. Like, you don't, you know, like yeah. Tamsha is very salesy. Like, yeah. they don't want to be there. Yeah. And you have to sell them. Yeah, you're trick. You trick them into the into the presentation, right. anyways. They but come in with their excuses already. Yeah, you know? they're like, "Don't buy anything. We're just here because we got the free lunch." Right. So. It just wasn't for me. Yep. Uh, and then COVID hit, the whole island shut down. We were locked. We couldn't even go to the beach. It was horrible. And so at that point... What part of Hawaii? Maui. I tried to go to Maui during COVID and I got 
turned away at the airport. Jeez. We had our COVID test by the Mayo Clinic, and they were only accepting COVID tests by Walgreens. Oh my God. So yeah. they, they sent us home. I bet. And they, they wouldn't let us out of the airport. Like we, we, they corralled us in that little area there, just beside the, the little bar. Yep. And um, we sat there for eight hours until the return, uh, a return flight took us back to LA. Terrible. What a nightmare. Okay, so that's not long ago. Four years ago, you're, yeah. you you leave Hawaii. So like, like your success is like within the last, with post COVID. Yeah, well, uh, acquiring real estate is a time game, and I sure. started acquiring real estate at eighteen. Yep. So a lot of you know, like, there's been so there was appreciation seven figures yeah. of okay. net worth added through the appreciation of the real estate. Got it. Uh, but. Most of the earnings I've had have been, yes, recently, um, since. So COVID hit, there was an opportunity to buy housing for cheap for a short period of time. Yep. Got a really good deal on a property, came here, seller financing, renovated it. Um, and then I started three construction companies. And so I had a glass company, a roofing company, and a general construction company. Are they still going? Uh, again, I'm very, one of my Achilles heels is I'm extremely trusting and I believe that people are as honest and trusting as me and have good intentions and, you know, won't steal from me and fuck me over and they continue to steal from me and fuck me over, you know, so I was very trusting in a, a partnership with somebody that I didn't know, uh, launching those companies who had said he, you know, was an expert in business. He had built a company, sold a company for millions of dollars and blah, blah, blah. I didn't even know what an operating agreement really was in 2020, 2020, okay. right? So we build these companies. We have 75 plus employees. We're doing Top Golf as an account. We're doing Whataburgers as an account. We're renovating houses. We're doing so much. Have a shop, you know, sign a commercial lease. Um, but I learned everything. Like I, he ended up, it ended up not being a disaster. But from the expense of loss, uh, it was a really good training because it gave me the understanding of how to run a business, build a business, um, hire employees, learn about insurance, learn about lawsuits, learn about bookkeeping, P and Ls, taxes, all the things that I needed Crash to really course. exactly. Yeah. yeah, and you of course you paid for it in the lost situation, and I'm sure you lost a little bit of money in that, but right. like you you paid for it, you got an education out of that. Exactly. Okay. And so, from that point, I felt confident to start my own business. And that's when I started the firm. But it was at that point in 2021, because that business only ran for like a year and a half, 2020 to kind of end of 2021, mid, I believe. I was like, you know what? Real estate's the only consistent in my life and it has been forever. So like, I'm all in yep. on real estate. Like I'd seen the appreciation, I'd seen, you know, been managing my properties. It had provided me the fi financial freedom, you know, 100 grand a year mm -hmm. um, is enough to live off of. And I was like, this Absolutely. is really awesome. So I was like, I am going to do, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna start a brokerage. We're gonna do luxury and commercial. And I'm going to brand myself as a commercial broker. And so that day I put out on Facebook that I'm a commercial broker and I started selling commercial real estate. Now, I mean, your confidence is bar none. And you back that up with the grit, the resolve, and then the knowledge to be able to execute on the things that you have a desire to, to accomplish. How have you dealt with, and you know, forgive me for the question because it's gonna be, I'm, I'm sure people are, are gonna ask and they're wondering it, so I'm just gonna say it. Yeah. Um, somebody that's young, beautiful, I'm sure you're gonna, you get all kinds of weird um, situations happen. Are you, do you get uh, like kind of dismissed ever? Yeah. Like she doesn't know anything, like she's just, you know, pretty girl or whatever. Like how do you, how do you overcome that and like exert your, A, your, like knowledge and your dominance in the situation but then like make sure everybody at the table knows who the fuck you are like how do, how do you how do you how are you accomplishing that yeah and that's a great question i think um a lot of people always ask me that or a lot of people will say even getting in real estate like oh, you're really young to be in real estate or you're really young to be selling the size of a deal or whatever but i think everybody's greatest disadvantage is also their greatest advantage sure. you know like i feel like 
um, yeah, when someone first meets me, they're like, oh, here's a dumb blonde, right? But then I open my mouth and I talk to them and I bring them a value and I show them what I've done and I um, provide knowledge that they don't even know. Like yep. most of my clients don't even know what cross segregation is when I meet them. And they're like, what the heck? Like I'm, my account never told me that, you know? And so just providing value beyond um, the initial judgment of what they think of you is how you build those relationships. And at the end of the day, people are gonna work with you who like you and trust you. And there's gonna be people that won't work with me. They're gonna work with their old 80 year old brokers that they've used for 80 years and that's fine. Sure. That's not my client. Um, there's, you know, I just have a very uh, surplus mindset and abundance mindset and there's enough to go around. And I have built my clients from providing value. You know, I started with doing small commercial leases and then building a team to handle those leases as I started to do some, you know, bigger multifamily and industrial and bigger things like that. Um, you know, I represented Empire Cat. You know, they became a, a client of mine. So those relationships and those seeds that you plant and then when you just do good work and be a good person. And I would just say like, even my first deal, I was 18 years old, just licensed, never done a deal in my life. And I told the client that. I was like, I just got my license. I've never done a deal in my life, but I can promise you, you will have 100% of my attention. And if I don't know an answer to something, I will find out from the best expert on that topic. And no one is gonna work harder for you than I will. So. And you and then you did that. And exactly then I did that. that, yeah. And so just being honest and... and yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, being honest and working hard and out, outworking everyone has really got me to where I am. And at the end of the day, the amount of money you make is a direct correlation to the amount of value you provide to people. Amen. So yeah. you can get a, a, across the initial judgment. But So how are you finding your clients? Like what's your main source of lead generation? So I started uh, by posting on every Facebook group I could, investor groups. Um, I was fortunate to be at residential brokerages, so I had a big residential agent network. Okay. So I reached out to them. Hey, if you ever have any commercial clients, I'd love to pay you a referral and work with you. So I have a large referral network in the residential space. Uh, so that's how I initially got started. People would reach out to me from investment groups, you know, funds looking to buy other investors nationally looking to buy a lot of my clients i've never even met we do a zoom call i find them properties i negotiate deals for them work with the attorneys um and then more recently i've as i've grown and developed i like i joined eo yep. entrepreneur organization and now i'm immersed in an amazing family of business founders owners entrepreneurs you know businesses from a million to billion sure um and those have become an amazing network for me i put myself into uh, you know, I have a horse. It's a big network. There's a lot of high network people. I, 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 so you ride the horse as well. You're equestrian? Like, yes. Okay. Um, that I dream get finally into, came true. I want to get into that in a minute because yeah. I, I'm fascinated by it. But so, okay, so posting a lot of outreach, a lot of um, uh, social media networking, mm -hmm. networking groups, so paid paid ne networking groups as well as yep. um, like membership-based networking groups. Are you involved in any masterminds? I'm not. No. no. I just started getting, I used to have um, really, really severe anxieties, like crippling, like I wouldn't leave the house. So most of my initial networking and business was online, mm -hmm. like um, Facebook groups and stuff like that. Are you like, you consider yourself introverted by nature? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, yeah, I think so. Like, I like to just be at home and be alone, yep. but I love being extroverted too because it's also my job and I love people. So I'm, I'm kind of mixed. Now I got over all the anxiety issues and I love being around people, and that's why now I'm like. How did just, you do that? Well, Butrin. <laughs> Thank you for the honesty. Yeah. Yeah. And it's uh, and it's helped you like since no no. Yeah, I wow. finally like went and sought help. Um, not you know a few four years ago probably and that's really when my business took off um, because I was healthy you know and when I started putting my my health first and my happiness and my mental health and my physical health um, I was able to expand and really grow to completely new heights because that's where your confidence comes from right like I would have never been seen on camera in a million years um, four years ago or three years ago right and so now that, yeah, Wellbutrin, uh, I took it and like literally, well, my anxiety was gone immediately. And then it, it allowed me to just think clearly and be able to start doing the things, like building the relationships, going to the gym. I meet a lot of my clients that 
Lifetime Fashion Square. Yeah. It's a high-end yeah. gym. Yeah. Everybody there is a business owner. Everybody yeah. there is wealthy. And we all, it's small, it's private, it's exclusive, and we all get to know each other. Um, co-ed saunas and hot tub, yeah. you know, yeah. you could do some good networking in For the sauna. Sure. So, um, yeah, just things that I love, passions, hobbies, and then um, entrepreneur groups and organizations are what I, you know, I'd love to be more a part of masterminds now and start working with um, people like yourself who really have these big networks and, and do, a, do a full service value out all around. Well, I mean, you're well on your way, and I, you know, I'm sure that after our collaboration, a lot of people will reach out and do business with you and find ways to, to collaborate and, and network with you. It's just, it's so interesting how sometimes something like this, a little thing like this will take you into a whole other yeah. path, which... Interrupting your regular scheduled programming for the following announcement. Squad Up Summit is coming to Orlando, Florida, April 23rd, 24th, and 25th. And it is gonna be the premier event for real estate investors. 3,000 wholesalers, creative financers, transaction coordinators, gator lenders, all the things that you're looking for in your business are gonna be in one room. Can you imagine that? Guys, get your tickets right now at squadupsummit.com. Link in the description. Now, back to watching me. Thank you. Which it did for me, too. I wasn't um, by any means a social media person. I was kind of coaxed into it, and then... Um, no, that's wonderful. Yes, thank you. Thank you. But, you know, the benefits of it have been just life-changing for me, right? And, um, there's moments of it where I'm like, ah, and then there's moments of it where I'm like, I'm so grateful, right? So I'm sure. Um, it's interesting though that you, I, that I haven't seen you do a lot more social media. Like, are, is it because like you're not really a fan it's of that? social anxiety. It's social anxiety, I yeah. want to. Yeah. Um, it's a goal of mine this year actually, which is okay. ironic that, you know, then it's you not randomly ironic. ran it's, into it's, it's, it's the way you think, you're, yeah. you attract things. Yeah. Uh, oddly, that's how it is, right? So you had made that goal and the universe will conspire with you to achieve what you're looking for yeah. because that's who Hannah is. Yeah. You get shit done, right? Um, which I, res I like madly respect. I think that's, that's, that's pretty dope. All right, so we're in the world of commercial real estate. You, are, you got a lending company, you are transacting. What's your, val what's your volume like in a year? Um, it's just uh, in... Which part? The lending and, or the, and the real estate? No, in the, in the, yeah, in the sales. So we did 60 million last year. Awesome. Um, and then that's when I was, you know, still building my lending business. Um, I, I really focus on mentoring agents. I, there's like a really soft spot in my heart for uh, people wanting to learn and grow and they don't have the mentorship or guidance or people tell them they can't do it or whatever. And if someone's hungry and they come to be hungry, I'll train them and I'll take this. Like I know my ROI is much better of course. networking and building my business, but I spend a lot of time mentoring and training agents uh, because that's a big fulfillment piece for me. And that's kind of, you know, I don't want children or anything like that. So like my legacy is helping other people build their legacy type thing. Um, and then, you know, the lending company uh, is really, really awesome. I am excited to scale that. Yep. But that one doesn't give you as much fulfillment. Like, over the past two years, I've doubled my money each year with the lending business, which is amazing returns. And, you know, my CEO coach will be like, why aren't you just doubling down on that? You know, but it doesn't give me that same, like, I love real estate. I love working with buyers and sellers and clients and agents and all of the uh, relational aspects of it, whereas lending is more of just like a transactional. Right. It's it's know. very it's very cut and dry, very business. Right. The, it either makes sense yeah. or it doesn't. The. But I'm reading the book right now uh, called 10x versus 2x. Okay. And so that's my goal this year is to 10x, right? So it's like, if I'm making a million dollars a year, how do I make 10 million ten. Yeah. and not in 10 more years, like yeah. now, yeah. right? So kind of getting yourself because. 2x is just doing more of what you're doing. Like, let me just sell more real estate, have some more agents, do some more loans, right? But 10x is like a full transformational shift. Like, if I say, Jamil, how do you 10x your business today? You can't, you uh, I, can't, you, right? It's a full, It's, it's everything. Yeah. Um, but I'm a little bit of a, I believe it's all inside out. So if I'm, if I'm wanting to 10x my, my world, I gotta take a look at where I am right now, specifically the way, the patterns I'm thinking in, mm -hmm. and then I have to take those thought patterns, those states, and I have to leverage them. I've gotta multiply them by 10. So like what does, for instance, my thinking on, on um, 
how much business I'm going to do. Okay, well, if this is going to produce $120 million this year, mm -hmm. how do I turn that into a billion dollars right. in, in revenue? Well, I got to think 10 times, I got I to gotta think 10 times greater than my current state. Mm -hmm. And oddly enough, when you start to elevate the thought patterns that you have, you bump into and create higher elevated relationships and situations and then that creates emotional states that are more elevated that then create opportunities and right. and, and lead you to the end right so I'm, I'm, I'm a little woo-woo in that world in that in that way but I've, I that's how, that's how I created my whole life um, I think it's an inside job and I think that you have been the embodiment of that you may not vocalize that or or say it but like you are H Hannah is the badass in here and then you came out and just expressed it but it was a manifestation of how you think you you your how you think is in, in, incredibly unique and powerful and it obviously has been uh, a driver to your success thank you I really appreciate that uh, you, you know thank yourself I mean, you're, you're, <laughs> you um, you're, you're inspiring you know I'm, I'm, I'm a I've been around the the block a lot, and uh, it's it's you know just rare to find people with that kind of drive and and a very clear clear goal. So what's next? Like, what are you trying to accomplish now? So I want to 10x, and it's funny yeah. because you're so right. Like when I was younger, I was in you know a circle of very low income people. So for me, for me, success looks like. Uh, making a hundred thousand a year, sure. or having which, a net worth of a million, which is amazing. Which is if amazing you, if you yeah. don't have that yet, right? Like, right. heck yeah. But and, and it's funny because like if you tell yourself, I'm going to make you know a hundred thousand dollars this year, you're probably going to make somewhere close to that. Sure. You're not going to make a billion, right? And so when I got there, and then I started to be like, oh wait, like I, when I was younger, I didn't know that a single person could build a multi-billion dollar company. Right. I thought that was just like, you know, the you governmental know. gods or whatever. Like, I didn't know that. The Illuminati. Like, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that that was a real option because yeah. I had never seen that. I never met somebody that had done that. And then, then I started saying like, oh, I met this person who makes, you know, $100 million a year or whatever, or has a, a billion dollar company. And like, they built that. Like, they wasn't handed that. Like, it's one person. It's not this massive corporation. It's not a stock. It's not an IPO. Like, whatever. Um, and so I started to think bigger. And that's where I am now is it's easy to get in the, the rat race, even in your own business, of just going through the motions and doing what you do. But you're going to stay pretty consistent doing that. Like, I'll sell a little bit more real estate every year, hire a few more agents, do some more loans. But How do you feel about public be, speaking? I've never done it, but it's on my goals. Is it? Fuck, I think she would kill it at the summit this year. Um... So I'm doing a big event in Orlando, April 23rd, 24th, and 25th. We're gonna have like 3,000 people in there. Um, myself, Pace, Grant Cardone, Donald Miller. Um, we don't have, I mean, Vina Jetty is gonna be there talking about multifamily. And she's, you know, she's a badass. I think somebody that you need to meet. She's, she's got a billion dollars under management. And, um, but we don't have anybody really um, dealing with uh, commercial and I think this like world of commercial wholesale could be a way for people to really scale their profit margins because we're now talking about asset classes that are so much more so what I really want to do is I would love to get a deal like we've got to get a deal on the books you yeah. and I and document that but in the meantime I'm gonna make an introduction um, next week for you to um, the people that are organizing it don't feel obligated or pressured. I, I, I can't to. even I can't even promise that it can happen. Yeah. But I think it's important that we at least approach the have the conversation because I think it would be really neat to see you in that um, to see you in that yeah. kind of space because it's uh, it's just it's a topic that is is very rarely dealt with or talked about is is commercial wholesale and how like. I can do, my average deal size or profit margin is like $15,000 a deal. That's chump change in the world of commercial, Yeah. right? So your average deal size or profit on a commission is what, 70,000, 50,000? Yeah, 100 yeah. plus usually, 100 yeah. plus. it's just about now, but it can change so much. You could be in commercial, like when I was first getting started, my business is, is growing very rapidly right now, so my deal sizes are going up very quickly. 
But yeah, I would say when I was the first two years, it was like average would be about 50,000 commission um, on a deal, on like a lease, even a lease deal. Um, but like what's so amazing in commercial is Actually, I was talking to somebody who said his dad bought McCormick Ranch back in the day uh, for $11 million. He sold it two years later for $100 million. Mm -hmm. And he told his son, he just passed away, he's 97, he told his son, the, like, the easiest way to make the most amount of money is at the top of the food chain. Like, nobody's coming in and buying massive properties like this. Like, everybody's buying houses. There's tons yeah. of competition. Yeah. Tons. And even multi is the next level up. There's tons of competition there. But true commercial assets, like... You have a vacant office building or, you know, this B of A tower that's vacant or you have um, all of these distressed assets that when a, they were bought based off of a cap rate, based off of a performing tenant, which values them at, call it a hundred million. Well, when that tenant no longer is there, the building's worthless. And then no, everybody's afraid to buy it because there's no tenant. There? Right. There's no tenant, right? right. And your holding costs alone are couple hundred grand a year, right? right. Your taxes and just holding to, to ma yeah. Ma yeah, maintain it and insure it and all those things. And then they're terrified. They're like, well, how do we repurpose this? Or how do we refill it? Or how do we do this? Or how do we do that? So, but if you can be the creative thinker to go in there and be like, okay, how do we take this failed asset that now these funds want off their books? They don't even, they don't want to lease them. They, they're not in the business of filling tenants they're in the business they're of not holding triple yeah. net real estate and so if you can go in there and you can refill them repurpose them rezone them redo anything with them the money i mean you're talking 70 million on a deal you know are you seeing a lot of commercial get repurposed or rezoned into uh, mixed use or or housing yeah although i don't like the condo to multi-family conversions uh it, it's very difficult to do. Okay. And I feel like it's easier to just scrape it and build multifamily than try to convert it. But yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of that and the, the creative thinkers who are going to come in and be like, okay, how do we convert this office into a mixed use building and make it something better? I'm, I'm still, hey, that can go, yeah. Thank you. Um, those are going to be, be the people that have those big wins. And if you can come in and collaborate together, like, it's not difficult. I don't think it's any more difficult than, you know, housing. Right. Um, you just have to have more money mm -hmm. or have people with more money. Mm -hmm. uh, be patient and know that there's holding costs. And, you know, like multifamily, you can have cash flow while you're renovating and stuff. So it's a little bit better. But, um, and then have the vision for the exit on the back end. Sure. And if you pair that with the right network with people who are looking to buy those assets, people who are looking to get rid of those assets, then I think the the margin for profit is just, it's on a whole nother level. Yeah. And you're not competing. People aren't competing to buy those assets. Right, because they're scared of them. Yeah, and they're pennies, pennies on the dollar, you know? Well, you know, I was, it's, it's so funny. Um, I've been I've been racking my brain for something to excite me because when you're when you're when you be, when you kind of reach mastery in a specific niche or whatever, which I feel I have in residential wholesale and residential real estate in general, like I, I understand it. I it's visceral to me, and I'm. I'm not challenged by it anymore, if that makes sense. And so like I've been a little bored. I've been I'll be honest with you. It's been you know, it's cool. I and I I still like enjoy I still enjoy the, the art of the deal and I still enjoy just putting things together and the money doesn't even matter at at, at you know at this level and that because I'm not doesn't make it doesn't make a difference to me, right? Like I don't even see the wires or whatever, it's just kinda they they happen. But I like the high I get from right. from doing a deal, but I've been, I don't know, I don't know what the word is. I'm trying to use like a, a, a like junkie terms. Like, um, I'm, what, what, what happens when you, you when you're withdrawals from the highs? Of, yeah, or like uh, you're, when yeah. you're when you're when it doesn't work anymore. What's that? Uh, tolerance. Yeah. yeah, I got my tolerance is. Yeah. I need I need like I need to. I need to do a different drug or something, you know what I mean? And I think 
it's been like poking at me. Commercials been poking at me in funny ways and kind of been showing me like, hey, you got to pay attention here. Um, I'll love some, yeah. Um, yeah, are you gonna have some more? I'm gonna have. Yeah, I'll take another bottle of that. Thank you. So, I'm gonna start kind of fishing around for some potential opportunities. And if you're okay with it, I'll float them by you and then kind of, you know, just with full honesty, tell me, no, um, this is not it. Or maybe if you got some time to kind of walk me through how you're looking at it so then I don't have to bother you and then I'll just send to you the things that I think are compelling or fit your criteria or your buy box. Um, but if we could if we could hammer that out, I can, I can see myself being able to turn on a, a faucet that could be endless. I, I, yeah, I'm definitely in, and that's exactly where I'm going right now, too, and what I want to do. Um, you know, even like using, instead of taking my commissions, using that as equity in the deal, yeah. you know, because yeah. that, that's what gets me excited, right? Yeah. Not the couple hundred grand or whatever. Yeah. It's like, I want, I want to be in the deal. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, that's piece. So, and it's, yeah, it's just distressed assets, um, and we're going to start seeing more of them, but when there's really good opportunities, so and, what sectors now? Let's let's dive into that. So where do you think the most opportunity is sitting? Is it office? Is it you know medical office? Is it is it retail? Strip uh, malls? What do you think? I have everywhere, all of the above. Um, I think it's if you can you make your money on the buy. Of course. If you can get in on the buy like there's the least amount of people probably buying like office, right? And retail probably um, because work from home and then Amazon and all of these things the, the future outlook for those are probably lower than say multifamily or industrial things like that now let me ask you this are there any issues like let's say for instance we, we create this pipeline right can I can you participate with me as a principal so let's say if I say okay Hannah I'm gonna I'm gonna bring the deal you bring the buyer uh, I'll wholesale it and I'll split the fee with you and then if you if you commission you know whatever we figure out how to how to do that yeah. but is are you is that doable in commercial or is, are there are there issues with that if you don't as long as you disclose it's doable it's doable no um, there's no like rest bump okay in commercial Fuck yeah man. like you can have JVs yes. you know, like it's, um, yes. yeah so like there's no seasoning of bonds money can come from anywhere anyone yeah i mean i'm no attorney so don't quote me on that if i'm yeah. wrong on something but from my experience it's, it's a very different world different world Dif different world that very little like just like doing commercial loans you know i'm like there's no regulation on how much i can charge you're like no they're invest at your own risk just don't lend on a residential single family owner occupied home and charge whatever you want. I'm like, okay. So I, I love the commercial space very much so. It's like, it feels like, like more gangster, dude. Like, it's, <laughs> like, what am I doing in single family? Like, I feel like I've just been in the, I've been in the wrong, I've, yeah, I've been in the wrong game. Well, single family keeps the cash flow. Turning. Yeah, but it's not gangster enough for me. You know? Commercial's like the you big, know? big money. You know, commercial's all about like, you take something vacant that's worthless, nobody wants to pay the holding costs on it, yeah. nobody wants to do the work to fill it. Yep. Thank you. So, it's not so much, it's the time. Damn. Hell yeah. It's not the quick money, yeah. right? But it's big money. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's a that's a sophisticated dish. Yeah, yeah. And I'm really excited to work with you. I think this is going to be a fun, fun uh, venture. I'm super interested in the lending. I'd like to be involved if you'll have me. I, um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm like, an, I'm very, I'm very easy to work with, and you know, understand. I might ask questions so that I, I can learn more, but I'm not like, um, I won't be a headache, you know? Yeah. I'm almost, I want to get started on the, the pipeline right now. Like I've got, 
Just keep eating. <laughs> Can you get ketchup, please? Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm really good, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Today is like, today's a great day. I mean, it's like a, it's a day of, of networking and food. I have, I have a, so a I got a dinner thing. It's like my first like influencer kind of dinner situation. And so I'm gonna get paid to eat which is not really my thing, but that's gonna be fun. And then I get to interview uh, a, a quantum neuroscientist. Wow. Yeah, and I'm really into that world of meditation, quantum physics, self-actualization. And so it's like, I, I, I nerd out on it. That's how I, I told you I was at a meditation retreat. Thank you. Last week. And then we meditated for 40 hours in a week, Hannah. Wow. Can you imagine? Have you ever done it before? No. Meditation? Are you, is it? No, I have. I, I have a, um, attempted yep. uh, multiple times. But my meditation for me really is like working out yep. and just in my music and I have no thoughts or riding my horse. And I, that's kind of where my... So take me into the, the world of your horse because it's, again, really specific. Was it like a childhood dream? And yeah. And how is it, like, what are you doing in it, with, it, with your, it, in your world right now? So from four years old, my friend took me to her barn where she had her horses and she was very wealthy. Um, and I fell in love with them immediately. And I obviously couldn't have a horse. You know, there are six figures a year to take mm -hmm. care of. And, you know, not all of them, but the ones that I wanted. There's, you know, show jumper, warm blood. They come, all come from Europe. Um, they're, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy. And it's a very elite sport. So I had a $3,000 college fund from my grandfather when I was young. I convinced my mother to let me take that out of the stocks and use it to buy a slaughterhouse rescue horse. And then we worked at the stable. To ride. So that, horses were really like my savior as a child. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they do horse therapy and horse this and horse that. And they're just very magical and they were just my home uh, pr pretty much. So I always, you know, was at the barn like as much as I possibly could be. But I always, you know, down the street from the barn I was at was the show jumping facility that I wanted to be at with the beautiful warm bloods and everything was so nice and gorgeous. My horse would flip over on me and trample me. And, throw me over the rail, whatever. So that was always my dream. And you gotta have money to do that. So you were riding the horses from the hood, but you were looking at the... Yeah, Got exactly. Okay. My friends rode at that bar and I would watch their videos. Uh, but I was like, one day, one day I'm gonna have my dream horse um, from Europe and show jump and- And you have that. him? Yeah, I do, yeah. I bought, I bought him January 1 of this year. So tell us about him. He's amazing. Uh, he's from- the, You light up like it's your baby. Yeah, I love him. He's the love of my life. He's, okay, um, what's yeah, his name? Curacao. It's Curacao. Um, Curacao? I call him okay. Bo, though. Okay. He is born in the Netherlands. Curacao is an island off the Netherlands. Okay. And uh, he's he won national champion last year in his division um, in Vegas. And, and do you do you you're not in the sport? I uh, am. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just now really getting professionally trained in show jumping and getting into it that way. Mm -hmm. I'm still at a, a difficulty though because it's a lot of time. Yeah. Most people that ride are retired or don't work or whatever because. I mean, if I go to the gym and go to the barn, I'm not behind my computer until 2.30. Mm -hmm. So it's just not a realistic life for me right now. So I really am, I'm only out there like two days a week. But they train him, take care of him, do everything, so. How far away is the stable from your home? Uh, it's like 12 minutes, 96th Street and Cactus. I'm in PD, so yep. pretty quick. But, I, um, I'm actually gonna cash, excuse me, I'm gonna cash flow him as well. How? So, people will pay like 75,000 a year to lease a horse. Uh, to lease my horse. And um, like those types of horses. And they want to ride it? They Like what do they want to They want to show, ride him. So, so basically they own him, but they don't. They okay. don't have to pay like the, 
you know, hundreds of thousands up front or whatever to, to purchase the horse. And especially if it's something that maybe is not the horse they want forever, but they just want for a year or two, and then they're going to upgrade to a different horse or whatever. And will you breed him then? No, he's a gelding. Okay. But I can lease him and make 75000 a year off of him. Um, and they pay all his bills, too. And I can still go out and ride, you know, yeah, yeah. once a week or something. So, again, I'm such a cash flow person. I bought the horse, and then I'm like, all right, I got to make money off this thing now. <laughs> but I love him so much. Does it feel weird to let somebody else ride your horse? No. No. Okay. And you know them. They're in the train. I mean, they're better riders than I am. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating person, Hannah. Thank I'm really you. glad to have met you. Me too. Thank you so much for doing oh, well, this. Well, yeah. No, it's like, it's it's really neat, and I'm uh, I, I'm I'm grateful to have my eyes open to other uh, situations and opportunities. I like learning. I'm like that just like you you know I'm, I'm a super nerd yeah although I don't like people knowing that but I'm I, I'm, I'm really nerdy about the things that I, I get into you know yeah so this is neat I feel like I've got a whole new ocean to swim in right now that I haven't really been paying attention to it's exciting yeah I'm excited and then also I've got access to so much residential for your people if there's like like I've got deals across the country I have franchises all over the United States. I've, it's insane. Like, deal flow is what is my name. Yeah. That's like, that's what I do, is deal flow. That's amazing. What you built. You just, you, you tell me where you want to see houses, I'll send you houses. Okay. Um, and I'm currently working on turning on the tap for commercial right now. And so, Give me a little bit of time there. I don't think it'll take me long, but give me a little time so I can start put, opening the doors of my network and then um, away we go. Yeah, like my... Um, Have you ever my met Grant? will flip the paper on commercial. You ever met Grant Cardone before? No, I want to. You do? I love him. Yeah, he's, he's a friend. So um, if I can get you to out to Orlando to participate in that event, you'll meet him there. I would love that. He, um, him and I had a conversation because in 08, I lost like $12 million, bankrupted my family, became homeless. Like went yeah. from, my sister and I had bought my, my parents a, a lake house. Wow. And um, you know, I, I, I bought this beautiful home on overlooking the city where I lived. And I just felt so proud of myself and so happy. And like this, because of leverage, I lost everything. And went from that situation to like my entire family living in a two bedroom apartment. And my goal was to just rebuild from that, right? And so when I got back into real estate, I said it in my mind, I'm like, okay, I, I, you know, I was like, I need, as soon as I have that 12 million cash, I'm like, I know I did it, right? And so I had that goal, and I accomplished it. And I'm sitting with Grant, and he's telling me that he went broke the same time I went broke in 08. I was down one point, I was like negative 1.8 million, the 12 plus negative 1.8. And I never BK'd, I'd actually paid that, that 1.8 back. Oh, wow. I just principles, you know, yeah. like I, could, I couldn't do it. And in the same amount of time that I did that, so like, let's call it 14 million for me, he makes a billion dollars, right? Wow. And I mean, he's a wonderful guy, but he's not smarter than me. I mean, he's not, right? I, like, and he'll even say it. He'll say, uh, Jamel, I think you're smarter than me, but I, yeah. I, I'm a bigger boss. But what he really yeah. has, but what he, what, and what he explained to me was, is he had a bigger target. And so when we both set our course and we're like, I'm like, yeah, I got to make this much money. He was like a billion. And he set a billion at his, as his target and and he got it. Right. Because that's where he set his mind and his intention. And he set his intention and his eyeball started recognizing the opportunities in the world. See, it's the reticulator, the ret reticulating activator um, in the brain that allows you to pay attention to things that 
you're trying to bring into your awareness, right? So like, um, what, what kind of car do you drive? The red car, yeah, the red car, yeah, I have a G-Wagon. Yeah, so you notice how you saw so many more of those yeah. once you bought it, right? That's all I see. And <laughs> that's because of what happens in the brain there. And so if you set in your mind, I want $250 million, I want to build a $250 million business, okay, cool. Now that that has become your your focused target, your brain will start identifying opportunities and yeah. people and, and situations that will get you closer to that. Right. So as a way to conclude this conversation, what is your target? So currently my target is $100 million. Okay. Um, I want a $100 million company and I want a million dollars of passive income, income a, month. a year and $10 million oh. in... Right, like at least 10 million in current income. Yeah. That's my next target. Okay. And then I make a new target from there. But it's a, it's a thinking. It's like you will never really surpass your target, right? But if you or have thinking. a bigger target, you might not get there, but you're going to get a lot closer to there. So that's where I'm thinking, and that's what I've been doing over this past you know year is like seeing, wait, okay, how do you get to... Uh, like Mark Moses, I just watched him speak. He's part of EO, and his company is a CEO coaching company. He does sixty-four billion dollars a year coaching CEOs. Wow! And I'm like, and, and he, his profits seven billion. And I'm like, holy shit! Like, and so then I started to think that I'm small-minded again, and I'm like, damn, there's so much out there, and that's something I've been struggling with lately. Is deciding what route to go forward with mm -hmm. because there's so many opportunities but you know I know real estate and I'm starting to know lending so in my head I'm like okay well let's go somewhere with those but you know in EO I'm like this guy has an e-com company selling CBD and he's doing 30 million dollars a month you know like there's different things out there that you just don't know about and so I really want to position myself but you have to do things that like light your fire right. you know like right. e-com doesn't light my fire but networking and building businesses and all of that stuff does so Hannah, thank you so much. This was like in incredibly informative. And for all of you guys that tuned in, I'm opening, as you can see, uh, a new lane of wholesaling commercial property. So if you've got anything that you think could be a potential deal, do me a favor, DM me, JDamG, on Instagram or Hannah at. Uh, Hannah B. Hammond <laughs> on Instagram, yeah. Hannah B. Hammond. Okay, guys, do yourselves a favor and follow this gal. Incredible content, and you can see one of the best, uh, one of the biggest badasses in commercial real estate. Thank you so much for your Thank time you. today. Thanks, Jamil. Great to get to know you. You too.